בוקר טוב, אני שמח לברך אתכם בכנס צ'ייס הרביעי 2009. יש לנו יום גדוש, עשיר ומעניין לפנינו. ושמח שאתם פה. אני רוצה להזכיר שיש ארבעה מושבים מקבילים, מיד אחרי המושב הזה. יש מושב פוסטרים, יש ארוחת צהריים עסיסית, ובסוף יש לנו הרצאת נעילה מעניינת במיוחד. אני מזמין בראשית את נשיאת האוניברסיטה הפתוחה, פרופ' חגית מסר ירון, לברך אתכם. בבקשה. בוקר טוב ליואב, תודה רבה. בוקר טוב ליו"ר המשת, ליהודית גלזר, ובעיקר לאורחים, לשותפים, לחברים שהגיעו הנה. אני יכולה להגיד לכם שבכמה חודשים שאני בתפקיד אני מברכת כבר מעת לעת. הגיל הממוצע של הקהל באירוע הזה ירד בצורה משמעותית <laughs> לאירועים אחרים. כנס צ'ייס למחקרי טכנולוגיות למידה 2009, האדם הלומד בעידן הטכנולוגי. מבחינתי הכנס הזה והאירוע הזה ומרכז צ'ייס עם הפעילות שלו, יש להם משמעות בשני מישורים. משמעות אחת זה במישור הלאומי, וההוכחה שכולכם כאן באמת מצדיקה את זה. האוניברסיטה הפתוחה כחלק מהתפיסת עולם שלה. כחלק מצורת ההתנהלות שלה מאז ומתמיד, היה לה דגש מיוחד על טכנולוגיות למידה ועל האדם הלומד בעידן הטכנולוגי. צורת ההוראה, צורת מתן ההשכלה הגבוהה של האוניברסיטה הפתוחה, שבאמת מביאה את החומר ואת ההשכלה הגבוהה אל התלמיד ולא את התלמיד אל הקמפוס ואל המקור הידע, באמת מצריכה התעדכנות שוטפת, מחקר שוטף בעניין הזה, ומרכז צ'ייס הוא אה, המסגרת המתאימה לכך. אני חושבת שראיתי את התוכנית, יש כאן יום מרתק של מחקרים מבית ומחוץ, ויורם ירחיב על זה את הדיבור אחר כך, אבל למרות המילה צ'ייס בשם, ולמרות שהיה פרסומים בעיתונים אה, שקרן צ'ייס נפגעה מהמשבר האחרון, המרכז הזה ימשיך להתקיים והכנסים האלה ימשיכו להוביל אותנו כל שנה אה, למשך אה, זמן רב בגלל החשיבות המאוד גדולה באמת שאנחנו רואים והצלחה, חברים עם הצלחה לא מתווכחים. האלמנט השני הוא האלמנט המחקרי של האוניברסיטה הפתוחה. האוניברסיטה הפתוחה, אני באה מאוניברסיטה סגורה, אמרו שעוד מעט כל האוניברסיטאות תהיינה סגורות חוץ מאוניברסיטה הפתוחה. אה, אז האוניברסיטה הפתוחה יודעת ויש לה מקום טוב מאוד במערכת ההשכלה הגבוהה בארץ, היא ידועה בכך שהיא אוניברסיטה שמביאה השכלה גבוהה איכותית ובהרבה מתווים ההשכלה הגבוהה שניתנת היום באוניברסיטה הפתוחה לבוגרים שלה היא יותר איכותית אפילו מאשר באוניברסיטאות הנחשבות יותר. השכלה גבוהה מהדרגה הראשונה עם אפשרות לכל אחד ואחד להשתלב בהם, אני לא אחזור על הדברים האלה הם ידועים, השיטה מוכיחה את עצמה, צורת ההוראה מוכיחה את עצמה, ההפרדה בין רמת התלמידים המתקבלים, שהכל פתוח לכל, לבין רמת הבחינה ורמת החומר, הוכיחה את עצמה כאמצעי מתאים לשמירת רמה. כלומר, בהוראה ובאוניברסיטאות הרגילות יודעים את זה, כשמגיע לאוניברסיטאות בוגר אוניברסיטה פתוחה, מגיע מישהו שאתה יודע בדיוק מה שהוא יודע. שהוא או היא יודעים היטב את החומר הנלמד, שהוא או היא בעלי כישורי למידה יוצאים מן הכלל, ושאם יש להם ציון מסוים, אז הציון הוא בדיוק על כמה הם יודעים בחומר. לכן, בעיקר מערכת ההשכלה בארץ מחבקת את בוגרי האוניברסיטה הפתוחה, והאוניברסיטה הפתוחה ידועה היום בתוך המערכת כמוסד להוראה, מוסד להשכלה גבוהה איכותי. הפן המחקרי של האוניברסיטה הפתוחה הוא קצת יותר נסתר. והוא קיים. באוניברסיטה הפתוחה יש 70 חברי סגל בכיר שמבצעים מחקר מקביל בכמותו ובאיכותו, לפעמים גם יותר מאשר כל שבע האוניברסיטאות האחרות בארץ שידועות כאוניברסיטאות המחקר. לידם יש חברים אחרים שגם הם עוסקים במחקר. זה אומנם לא אלף כמו באוניברסיטת תל אביב, אבל זה 70 איכותיים. הפן המחקרי הזה הוא קצת יותר נסתר. מרכז צ'ייס הוא אחד המרכזים שבו נעשה מחקר שקצת יותר רואים אותו כלפי חוץ ואחד הכיוונים שאני חושבת עליו כלעתיד זה באמת 
לשכפל את ההצלחה הזאת ולנסות להביא לכאן עוד מרכזי מחקר שיביאו לידי ביטוי ושיעשו, המילה העברית היא צבר, אני חושבת, לקלאסטר. קלאסטרים של חוקרים באוניברסיטה הפתוחה עם עמיתים מאוניברסיטאות אחרות שיצליחו להדגיש את הנושא הזה כלפי חוץ. אז הנה יש לנו את היום עיון הזה שמביא לידי ביטוי גם נושא ייחודי של האוניברסיטה הפתוחה, גם יכולות מחקריות באוניברסיטה הפתוחה ואחרים, גם קהל נפלא וגם נושאים מעניינים, אז אני מאחלת לכולם, בעיקר למארגנים ולמשתתפים וגם לכל אלה שבאו לשמוע, הרבה הצלחה ויום נעים. תודה רבה. אני רוצה להזמין פרופסור יורם אשת אלקלעי, ראש מרכז צ'ייס, לברך. שלום, לא התחתנתי, שואל אותי מזה על כל הזה. זה תמיד היה. ברוכים הבאים לכנס האדם הלומד בעידן הטכנולוגי, כנס צ'ייס 2009 לטכנולוגיות למידה. אני בראשית הברכות, אני כבר עומד פה פעם רביעית ברצף, אני רוצה לומר כמה מילים על טכנולוגיות למידה, דווקא על הפרדוקס של טכנולוגיות הלמידה. קודם כל, זה שלושה פרדוקסים. שאנחנו חווים אותם בעבודה שלנו. אחד, הם לא פותחו לצרכים חינוכיים, רוב טכנולוגיות הלמידה שאנחנו משתמשים בהן לא פותחו עבור צרכים הוראתיים או צרכי למידה, ואנחנו, האתגר שלנו הוא לעשות להם אדפטציה לתהליכי הוראה או למידה. הטכנולוגיות האלה מאפשרות אינטראקציה מאוד אינטנסיבית ומזמנות אותנו לבחינה מחודשת של תהליכי ההוראה והלמידה שלנו, סוגיות שקשורות לכיצד אנשים לומדים. מועלות מחדש על ידי האינטראקציות המתאפשרות על ידי הטכנולוגיות ומעל לכל הטכנולוגיות האלה מצויות בהשתנות מתמדת מה שאומר שאנחנו צריכים כל הזמן לחדש את הפרדיגמות ואת הגישות השונות שאנחנו מאמצים בהוראה ולמידה בהטמעה של אותן טכנולוגיות וזה מעמיד בפנינו ארבעה אתגרים מרכזיים אחד זה פיתוח של מיומנויות קוגניטיביות וחברתיות רגשיות לשימוש אפקטיבי בטכנולוגיות זה לא טריוויאלי לנהל שיעור עם 40 תלמידים באונליין. זה לא טריוויאלי לשוטט באינטרנט עם בני אדם ולבצע אינטראקציה אפקטיבית. זה מחייב אותנו להבין מהו הפוטנציאל הפדגוגי שטמון במשחקי מחשב, בטכנולוגיות כמו וויקי, בטכנולוגיות כמו רשתות חברתיות וכולי. זה מחייב אותנו בסופו של דבר לפתח תיאוריות ומודלים הוראתיים שעושים שימוש נבון בטכנולוגיות האלה, ומעל הכל להבין את האימפקט שיש לטכנולוגיות האלה על חברת האדם. בשביל להשיג את כל ה... להתמודד עם כל האתגרים האלה, זו נחוצה קהילה. קהילה של אנשי מקצוע שנפגשת ומדברת ומפתחת בתוכה שפה מקצועית. וזאת המטרה של כנס צ'ייס, להוות מעין זירת מפגש של חוקרים ופרקטיקנים שעוסקים בתחום, תוך קיום קשר עם קהילות מקבילות בחו"ל. לפני שלוש שנים, ב-2006, עמדתי פה לפניכם וציינתי בברכותיי לבאי כנס צ'ייס הראשון. את המישן של הכנס בהעלאת תרומה לגיבושה של קהילת אנשי טכנולוגיות למידה בישראל. היום התכנסנו לכנס הרביעי, וההיקף הגדול של הגשות שאנחנו רואים כבר ארבע שנים, וזה מתנהל כמו שעון שוויצרי, ערב הכנס, ערב הדדליין להגשות, אנחנו עם שלושים, עשרים וכמה הגשות, ואז איזה בום כזה גדול, ואנחנו מגיעים לאותן שמונים, תשעים הגשות, זה כנראה משהו באופי הישראלי שברגע האחרון לעשות את כל הסאבמישן, ואז כולנו בטירוף. אבל ההיקף הזה הגדול וההיקף הגדול של ההרשמה לכנס הם עבורנו אינדיקציה שאנחנו מצויים בדרך הנכונה. במסגרת המאמצים שלנו לשפר את מעמדו של הכנס ולאפשר למציגים הרחבת החשיפה הבינלאומית, לאחר הכנס יופץ קול קורא בקרב אלפי חברי עידן, הרשת האירופית ללמידה מרחוק, שיוזמנו כמו בשנה שעברה או שנתיים הקודמות בסיוע של גילה קורץ שאנחנו מודים לעזרה פה, יזמין את חברי עידן לאינטראקציה עם האנשים שהגישו פה את העבודות, ינגיש את החומרים שלכם, כך שאולי תזכו לאינטראקציות או שיתופי פעולה עם אנשים בחו"ל. בנוסף, כותבי המאמרים המצטיינים השנה יוזמנו להגישם לפרסום בגיליון מיוחד של כתב העת Interdisciplinary Journal of E-Learning and Learning Objects, והחל מחודש הזה מאוכזרים כל המאמרים של הכנס על ידי Google Scholar, מה שאולי יעלה את ה... כמות הסייטיישנס שלכם בגוגל סקולר. כמה מילים קצרות על מרכז צ'ייס, יש פה הרבה אנשים צעירים אולי פעם ראשונה, אז כמו שהזכירה פרופסור חגית מסר ירון, זו זרוע המחקר של האוניברסיטה ללמידה, לחקר טכנולוגיית למידה. המרכז הוא קונסורציום של למעלה מ-40 חברי סגל של האו"פנים, פריקים של טכנולוגיות. 
שמקיימים ביניהם ימי עיון, כנסים, סמינרי מחקר, סדנאות וכולי, חלקים, מי שמצאו אצלנו על הרשת, רשת המיילים, אני בוודאי מקבל את ההודעות על הפעילויות השונות. אני מניח ששמעתם, וחגית הזכירה קודם, את הקשיים אליהם נקרא המרכז, נקלע המרכז עקב סגירתה של פעילות קרן צ'ייס, אבל כמו שהבנתם מהודעה של נשיאת האוניברסיטה הפתוחה, אנחנו לא ניתן לה... האוניברסיטה לא תיתן למרכז לגבוה ונמשיך לפעול ולהפעיל את המרכז באותה אינטנסיביות שעשינו את זה בעבר, זאת הבטחה. עכשיו החלק הכי נעים בברכות לבאי הכנס זה התודות. אני מבקש להודות לכל מי שהשתתפו עמנו בארגון הכנס, להנהלת האו"פ שתומכת בארגון מתחילתו בתקצוב ובכוח אדם, לוועדת הארגון שעשתה לילות כימים בארגון האירוע. לחברי ועדת התוכנית שטרחו על אינטגרציה של שלל המחקרים שהתקבלו להצגה לכדי מושבים, מושבי הרצאה ותוכנית קוהרנטית, לעשרות שופטי המאמרים שסייעו לנו לשמור על רמה גבוהה של המאמרים שהתקבלו לכנס, לחבריי בוועדת ההיגוי של מרכז צ'ייס, השותפים עימי בנהוגה של הספינה הזו, לאנשי מערך התפעול, הרכזים שטורחים להכין ולתפעל את האולמות והכיבוד, לטכנאים המצלמים את האירוע, לאנשי הגרפיקה וההוצאה לאור שעמדו על הפקת ספר המאמרים המהודר, לאנשי יחידת המחשב, למחלקת יחסי הציבור של האו"פ, ולעובדים רבים אחרים של האו"פ שהושיטו יד ככל שיכלו להפקתו של הכנס. והרבה הרבה אנשים השתתפו באופרציה הזו. ויסלח לי כל מי ששכחתי לציין אותו במקרה ממש שלא בכוונה. ומעל הכל, כולנו חייבים תודה גדולה למר סטנלי צ'ייס, שאיפשר בתרומתו הנדיבה את הקמתו של המרכז. ואשר נקלע לקשיים כלכליים קשים. אני מבקש בשם כולנו לשלוח לו את אסירות, תוד... את אסירות תודתנו על אצילותו ורצונו הטוב, ולאחל לו בריאות וחזרה לשגשוג גם בימי משבר אלה. And finally, I wish to welcome our overseas guests who fled the Chile American winter in order to enjoy the warm Mediterranean hospitality. Our keynote, Professor Judith Donat from MIT, and Professor Yair Levy and Michel Ramim from Nova Southeastern University, who has become kind of members in our community. Yair is now in the, in the program committee of the conference, and they will present the research here, and I wish all of us an exciting conference. Thank you very much for joining us today. It is my privilege and honor to welcome Professor Judy Donat to be our key note speaker in this <coughs> fourth Chase uh, conference. Uh, Professor Judy Donat is the director of the Sociable Media Research Group at the MIT Media Lab and a faculty fellow at Harvard's Berkman Center for Internet and Society. Her work focuses on the social side of computing and she is known internationally for pioneering research in social visualization, interface design, and computer-mediated interaction. She created several of the early social applications for the web, including the first postcard service, the electronic postcard, and the first interactive juried art show, Portraits in Cyberspace, which those of you who attended Monday's lectures may have seen some example of. Her work with the Social Media Group has been exhibited at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston and in several New York galleries. She was the director of Identity, a collaborative exhibit of installations examining how science and technology are transforming Port Fletcher. Her current research focuses on creating expressive visualization of social interactions and on building experimental environments that mix real and virtual experiences. She has a book in progress about how we signal identity in both mediated and face-to-face -face interactions. Professor Donat received her doctoral and master's degree in media arts and sciences from MIT. Her bachelor degree is in history from Yale University. And she has worked professionally as a designer and builder of educational software and experimental media. Today, Professor Donat will talk to us about Faces, Fashion, and Facebook, Understanding Social Signals in Online Communication. Thank you, and good morning. So um, what I'm going to be talking about today is signaling theory, which is an approach to understanding communication that first came out of biology. So I'll be drawing the connections from why gazelles might jump up and down when they're faced with a predator, all the way to how people signal their identity online. So I'm just going to start by, this are a couple of pages from an online dating site. 
The idea with signaling is, the reason that signaling theory is... The, uh, the reason that signaling theory is so apt for thinking about online communication is that online everything is a signal. There, you don't see anything about the other directly. Everything is moderated through the medium of the computer. And so understanding, signaling theory is effectively a economics of communication. And so understanding how that economics works in a domain in which everything is signal is very important. So the basic idea behind this theory is that what to, much about what we want to know about others or animals want to know about each other are things that you cannot perceive directly and that we rely instead on signals of those things. Um, and here I just want to talk a little bit about some framework for what this theory is. And in particular, the, everything that we use to find out something about another person, to make sense of the people around us, we can call under the large term cues. But there's two types of cues. One we'll call evidence. They're unintentional things that you give off. So for instance, if a mosquito notices some um, carbon dioxide and says, hmm, some tasty prey is here, I'm going to have lunch, you didn't intend to signal your presence to that mosquito. That was the unintentional evidence of your presence. Signals are things that either evolved or are simply intended consciously or subconsciously for communication. So they are things that, are, that their purpose is communication. And that's very important for understanding how this economics of communication works because as we'll see, it's when they cease to function as communication that um, we see a lot of the um, balance in how it works where something that's evidence is, doesn't have those same constraints on it. So for example, um, we can look at something like a fur coat. On the one hand, a fur coat might be something that a person buys as a signal of their wealth. They're very expensive. They might signal it as a, it might be a signal of their fashion, which we'll talk about more in depth later. So those are communicative signals. If you look at it and you think, oh, what this tells me about this person is that they are cruel to animals and have no heart. That was not their intended signal. That's an unintended cue. So one important piece to understand, so a lot, I'm not going to be able to explain all of the nuances of signaling today, but that it's also, a lot of it has to do with the perception of the receiver and the intentions of the signaler to understand how it functions. Now, the big problem with relying on signals instead of direct observation of the trait that we're interested in is deception. Because, in fact, it is often very useful, if you think about it, if someone is not going to observe some trait of yours directly, you can't directly see if you're a nice person or you know, if you really like someone, uh, is that it can often be useful to be deceptive and be able to give off a signal that you are nicer than you are for animals. As I said, this came originally from biology, to be able to signal that they're stronger than they are. So the whole economics is really about the balance of how do signals maintain their reliability in face of the fact that it can often be quite useful for the signaler, though not for the receiver, um, to be deceptive. Um, so this theory actually came originally from Israel. Amot Zahavi is a biologist who came up in the mid-70s with this notion of handicap, what he called handicap signals. The idea here is that the costs in the domain of a, the resource being signaled ensure their honesty. He was interested in things in the animal world that normally seem you know, hard to understand. Why do um, peacocks have such big tails? Um, and, a cup, and what his theory was, was that these were not sort of strange runaway traits that some evolutionary biologists thought they were, but they actually had an important communicative purpose. So for instance, the very, very large antlers that some animals have, that are hu they're huge, they're very, very costly. They are so costly they can take up to almost 50% of the metabolic energy of that animal simply to grow these antlers every year and hold up their head. Why would they do that? Well, it, it, at least according to this theory, and again, with many of these things, it's a theoretical interpretation, so we can't say it's absolutely the fact of why it evolved this way is that 
it's very, very costly for them to actually fight. But the things they're fighting over, access to females, access to territory, are very important. So that if you are going to simply be able to look at the other and not have to engage in a fight that could be, in the end, deadly to both, it needs to be a signal that's very reliable. By being able to waste some of the, so much of their energy, it's a way of showing that an animal that is not actually very strong cannot afford to waste so much energy and so cannot have that kind of antler than the ones that have them, it is reliable. The picture at the bottom shows gazelles doing something that has mystified many biologists, it's called stotting. And it turns out that when chased by some animal, uh, other predators, gazelles will jump up and down instead of running off, even though they're very fast. The fastest ones stay in place and jump up and down. And this area here says, and it turns out that the predators do not go after the ones who do this. What the, the signaling theory says is that it's a way of being able to show, I am so fast, and if you come near me, I will run off and you will just waste all your energy chasing me that I can afford to waste the time and energy to jump up and down. We see reflections of this theory in the work of Thorsten Veblen, who was a um, one of the early sociologists at the turn of the 20th century. He was interested when we bring it into human society, though he obviously predated uh, uh, Zahavi by quite a bit, but he was looking at what he called the theory of the leisure class. You know, how do people signal their class distinctions? And you know, he was interested that the well-off have a lot of leisure, but nobody actually wants to sit around and watch you do nothing for a year. It would be very boring to do that. So instead, we have signals of the accomplishments we can have that we were able to have only because we didn't have to spend that time working. So he gave examples like knowing a dead language, such as Latin, or at that time, probably Hebrew, um, being able to um, have really, really good grammar, to be able to have fancy, um, to play fancy sports as a way that you could signal all the time you spent doing something that did not involve making a living. We see a version of this today. This is a screenshot from an online game where a tremendous amount of the imagery is essentially showing how much time you spent building up different tasks. So it's a shot that says this probably student has spent hundreds of hours not having to study, but instead being able to play this game. And so it's again a signal of, um, of time and leisure time. Um, the type of costs, again, that we're talking about are, can be money, they can be time, they can also be opportunity costs. If you decide to get a tattoo on your face or, or pierce your face entirely, it's a way of signaling your commitment to an alternative culture and the cost that you pay, aside from the discomfort and having done this initially, but the real cost is in the opportunities for other employment, for other work, for membership in other social groups. It's a costly signal of social affiliation that says I am so dedicated to making this statement that I will give up many, many opportunities in order to do so. I'm just going to talk a bit about, so since, um, since this work in the 70s, there's been quite a bit of work in looking at what are some of the other types of signals that there are. I'm going to go through two other types quickly. One is index signals um, are things that are costly only for those who don't have the signal of quality. So the important thing about the handicaps that Zahavi was talking about was that they signaled a resource by wasting it. So um, in this book by Maynard Smith and Harper that looks at a lot of signals and talks about indexes, they sh use the examples of um, how tigers signal how big they are in their territory. And it's actually quite simple, is that they scratch trees. They sharpen their claws and they scratch trees, but the other tigers know, can, they believe they can assess these signals because if you're a very big tiger, your scratches are really high up. If you're a little tiger, your scratches aren't very high. It's not a costly signal, but it's a very difficult one to fake. And one of the reasons I'd like to use this example is that in this book on signaling, which most of it is, is actually very dry, it's not very funny, they make this little remark and they said, well, this is reliable only because tigers haven't figured out how to stand on boxes. If they figured out how to stand on boxes, then it wouldn't be reliable. And that's a, for understanding, most of what I'm interested in is how do we adapt this theory to understanding human behavior 
And the thing about humans is we can always figure out a way to stand on boxes. And a lot of what I'll be talking about are the different ways that humans effectively stand on boxes. There is almost nothing we can think of that's an absolutely reliable signal in human communication. There will always be someone who figures out a clever way to get around it, and that is at the heart of a lot of very interesting and inventive human behavior. So the final type of signal I want to talk about is called conventional signals. And these are signals that have very little cost, they're very, very easy to cheat, but they are kept honest through outside mechanisms, usually by social sanctions. Their existence in the animal world is um, actually quite controversial, and there's lots of papers written about whether they actually exist in the animal world, but there's a tremendous amount of conventional signaling in the human world. It's a great deal of what, how we communicate is through things that aren't Insured, their honesty isn't insured simply by the form of the signal, but to a large extent by what will happen to you if you are caught lying. So, for instance, a police badge. There's nothing that inherent in the look of that badge that says you have this authority. It's a symbol of that authority. It's kept honest by the trouble that you would become in if you wear it when you are, do not actually have that authority to say that I am a policeman. Um, also in the category of conventional signals are things such as you know, wedding rings or engagement rings that signal that you are committed to another person. And here is, um, again, one of the interesting complexities of this type of theory is that you know, something like a diamond ring is certainly a very expensive object, but it can be, something can be a signal in different domains and be a conventional signal in one domain and be a inherently reliable costly signal in another. So something like this would be a costly signal in terms of wealth, but on the other hand in terms of its um, signal of commitment, it's in that way it's by convention, it's by agreement, and it doesn't necessarily, can, it can be worn by someone who doesn't have the underlying feeling though it's a reliable signal that they actually spent the money on it. And there's interesting ways we'll talk about later about how these things can balance and trade off with each other. Um, something like wearing a kippah is a, again, a conventional signal, of any kind of religious signal is a signal of affiliation and will be very, very culturally bound. This is a picture of American Vice President Al Gore wearing a kippah. He clearly is not Jewish. Here again, a lot of the meaning of something as a signal becomes very context dependent and interpretive, whereas it's certainly a physically easy thing to, for anyone to put on their head. Depending on the context, the meaning can be very, very deep or complex, and it can either be a simple signal, you know, that you know, you're, you're visiting another country, you're doing this by um, courtesy, or it can actually be a very, very costly signal because you're doing it at a time where such a signal has um, deep and difficult connotations. So again, for the conventional signals, a lot of the cost has to do with the surrounding culture. In the online world, again, we see almost everything is conventional signal. I know it's, for some of you this is hard to read and it's small, but this is an example of what you probably all see plenty of, which is scam emails. You know, in this case, this is um, someone offering a fine business opportunity in North Korea. Um, and so here, one of the problems that we, we constantly face in the online world is that actually applying any kind of social sanction is very difficult. It's very hard to find the people who write um, letters offering investment opportunities in Nigeria or to fix your bank account if you only send them your password. And so here, one of the things we're seeing is this balance where, you know, enacted today, if we cannot impose the social sanctions on the senders of these things, are we reaching the time where the signal itself, any kind of email, starts to be increasingly useless to the point where is it going to, as a signal, 
become useless, certainly for many types of unsolicited of mail that comes from people you don't know, you increasingly see that the value of being able to communicate in this way is going down. So the costs borne by deceptive signaling, it's important to see here, are both borne by the receivers who get this false email. They're also borne by honest signalers who increasingly find that more and more barriers are being put up to what had been an easy way to signal, but now because of the prevalence of deceptive signalers, more and more costs have to be imposed on email. There are even um, propositions for making it literally financially costly to sell, send an email as a way of balancing um, a lot of the scams. So basically our ability to cheat shapes a great deal of human society. Um, some quick examples, you can say an expensive car is a signal of wealth, but then we have all kinds of rental agencies that will let you give this signal for a day or a week at you know, a fraction of the cost. Um, even some of the basic indexes, such as a youthful face, the picture on the, these are before and after pictures that were taken from a plastic surgery site. So even some basic indices, such as smooth skin being a signal, being an index signal of youth, um, which for most of human society has simply been something you can only give by being youthful, increasingly we can um, cheat this signal through a little surgical intervention. Um, the signal of saying, I've gone on a lovely, lovely beach vacation, and now I have come home with a beautiful tan to show how much leisure I have, has spawned a huge industry in fake tanning products. So you can sit home or spend all your days working hard, but you will still look, you know, or you can sit in a tanning bed. But even though you didn't get to go on the vacation, and you've been working all the time and actually spending your weekend sitting in a very uncomfortable tanning bed, you can show up on Monday looking like you had a lovely vacation. So the basic economics of signaling are that the costs of the signal in that domain help keep it um, honest, and they're the inherent costs, so for instance, one of the things that's important to keep in mind also is that any signal can have these multiple costs. So some are these, the inherent costs, such as in the costly signals. There are the sanctions that society can additionally impose to make it more costly. There are the costs of amplifying the signal, such as financial costs, not in that domain, but that are a way of saying, you know, of adding an extra sincerity to it. On the other hand, and this is a little counterintuitive, and we're going to talk next a little more in depth about this, are that there's the benefits. There's the communicative benefits of the signal. Obviously, I'm not going to bother to make any of these signals if I don't get some benefit from the recipient having changed their opinion of me or their behavior in response to my having communicated. But there's also um, benefits in the utility of the signal itself, and that can be a trade-off. We're going to talk a little bit about that next. Um, and just sort of to sum up the basic economics, is rather simple, even though the different costs can make it complex, is that a reliable signal is one in which the benefit of signaling honestly is greater than the cost of signaling, and the overall benefit of signaling dishonesty is um, less than the cost. And that would make for the reliable signals. How we add that up and how we apply it to looking at different things online is what I'll talk about next. So first, I want to talk about fashion. And here I mean fashion in a very wide sense, so not just fashion and clothing. There's certainly fashions in academic subjects. You know, um, different topics become fashionable, different approaches are in style or not. There's fashions in business practice. There's fashions in all, in all kinds of things. And what's, um, I think, particularly important about it is that as we live increasingly in an information-based society, Fashion is about taking risks and adopting the new, and it has to do with your access to information. So in a world that's increasingly dominated by information and through and constant technological change, fashion in this very, very broad sense is a very, very important force in how we adapt to change, how we react to it, and how we signal our um, the strength of our ability to adapt to new information. So as a sort of theoretical approach, understanding fashion really started with the early sociologist George Simmel, 
who was writing in the late 19th century, and he's the one who initially thought of the model of fashion that is generally accepted today of imitation and differentiation, which is that you know, he saw society, society as very stratified, and he said you would have an upper class that does something, perhaps dresses in a particular, particular way, to differentiate from the next group lower. That next group wants to appear like them, they will imitate them, and then this group has to differentiate itself in a new way, and that that's the basic mechanism behind the fashion cycle. Uh, we certainly see a great deal of fashion in um, different types of technologies. You know, this is an iPhone, which part of it, um, there's a very, very fast adoption to things that are seen as fashionable. And one of the questions I want to look at here is how the relationship between fashion and utility, of how useful something is and how that affects the way it's signaled. So for instance, we can look at, what I'd like to do is sort of divide up the benefit of something being new. On the one hand, you have what we'll call the fashion signal, which is a way of using this object to say, to say I am affiliated with this particular group that now all is doing this one thing, and I have the knowledge to know what is the current way of signaling this affiliation. And on the other hand, something can have a real utility. You may say, I'm adopting this because it's useful. Um, an example of that, of the, of the way these trade off, are things, you know, for instance, in this case, the picture on the um, left is one of the early ads for Bluetooth telephone um, earpieces, where they were initially shown, we're trying to pass these as saying, this is a really, really fashionable thing, that if you have this, you will appear to be at the forefront of technology, well beyond everyone else. And the early adopters, whether they thought it was useful or not, often are the people who like to present themselves this way. These are now extremely common the, um, and spread well beyond that. So now its role is primarily not something that um, is about saying that I'm at the forefront, but people who use them are say, this is useful, I can talk on the phone and drive at the same time. Um, and then for people whose highest interest in it is fashion, a lot of interviews say they no longer want to be seen with it because the social message has changed so much. Um, Everett Rogers is the person who did a lot of work with making these different adoption categories. And he wrote a book called The Diffusion of Information where he modeled it by saying that there's a group of early innovators who invent the new things and a set of early adopters et cetera, you, know, you can see the early, this is sort of the curve of how people adopt new things. His interest was here in looking at why people and how people adopt things that have utility. And in particular, what he was interested in, and, and we are from the fashion perspective, is that adopting something new has a great deal of risk. By the time that late majority adopts something, they have the benefit of all the experience of the people ahead of them. So they know this is something that works, it's something useful. Um, they've lost out the opportunity to be on the early side of it, but they have also not taken the risk because the early adopters, what's important here in terms of being able to signal information prowess is that the early adopters have had to take a big risk. If you are not very good at assessing things that are new in a particular domain, it's extremely risky to be at that early edge. So it's a way of signaling your confidence in your own assessment ability, whether it's knowing what's in style or knowing what's useful, to be at that very, very early side. And this fashion is a very complex signal where the risk taking in doing something new also has issues of access. Do you have access to the information to say what's new? Do you have the taste to know for fashion what are the particular social signals it will be giving and the costs and time and money, etc.? So one way you can see this balance between taste and fashion is with things that are very typical for fashion. Um, it's very interesting to watch things such as shoes where the trade-off between how useful something is and how fashionable it is is very, very stark. Um, many things that, whose purpose is to show social affiliation through fashion are very 
unutilitarian. They actually, there's this cost to be paid in comfort and practicality, there's monetary expenses, whereas the things that have a high utility and are very useful, because it's hard, for instance, as with the Bluetooth headset, to differentiate the adopters who have adopted something because of its usefulness from those who have adopted it as a social signal, they function much less well for social signals. Um, this is the same things in things like taste and painting. This is a easy to like painting. It shows a landscape. And then this is this is um, work of Damien Hirst, a British artist who's one of the top selling artists today, whose work is he's you know, this is a um, preserved calf. He has some other works of preserved sharks that are deliberately extremely difficult. For the people who pay the very, very high prices of his art, it's a, a being able to express your willingness to take a huge risk in something that is effectively a current fashion. There's a tremendous amount of fashion online. So here's some examples from um, Facebook where there are fads that move through it on almost a daily basis. And that's one of the other interesting pieces around fashion is that the rate of change of fashion has to do with how fast information moves. So when fashion, as we understand it, first came about in the 15th century, um, it took about a year for information to move from Paris, which was even then a fashion capital, to you know, the outskirts in Poland. And so the rate at which fashions changed was very slow. As information and communication have speeded up, the rate of change of information gets faster and faster, and so that ability to imitate becomes faster and faster. And online, you can, you can see things. For instance, there are um, tests that people put themselves through on Facebook, where they take hours and hours to do. People, it becomes a fad for a day. And the next day, there's a new one that sweeps the site. And everyone has to fill out a whole new series of questionnaires. And so the rate of change is, is at internet speed. Um, in terms of the cost, this is a, a picture of Second Life. Dell computers have a site in Second Life. And this is an example of something where it's still an open argument about the risk of adoption of something like Second Life, where it's a, a new technology, it's a 3D, immersive 3D world. And those who are adopting, in particular companies such as Dell and IBM, are making, and some companies don't, are making a somewhat risky fashion statement by saying, we have, okay, we're IBM, we're Dell, we have to have a site in Second Life, it's the place to be, is a way, they are signaling that they have knowledge of a interesting new technology, that they're at the forefront of it, that their clients should know that they, that they know what's new and what's next. But the risk is that this may not be the biggest, newest, next thing. Many of these companies have come out with statements saying, we know this is the next web. But maybe it is, and maybe it isn't. And so here you see again that there is a real risk in this adoption, not only because of its utility, but because of that fashion statement that it makes that says, I really understand what is the next new thing. I know where to, put, to place my money and my image. If it turns out that immersive 3D spaces are kind of an interesting side track, but in two years no one is interested in them or, or at all, then the places that have made a big bet on putting their self-presentation in these spaces can look a little foolish, which is the risk that you know, one makes when one is at the forefront of any such statement, is that you have the benefit if you are correct in your assessment, but there is that real risk of being wrong. The other cost that I just want to look at briefly um, in terms of internet fashion is that fashions are costly in a real sense. This is actually a, a photograph of discarded cell phones hundreds of thousands of discarded cell phones, most of which were discarded because they were last year's fashion. And one of the problems with fashions is that while at heart they are about signaling information prowess, your 
ability to master this world of information, they are embodied in physical goods. And so what is happening, as we all know, that as fashion moves faster and faster, these physical objects become quicker and quicker to be discarded in a way that's become very clear is not at all sustainable. So I think one of the things that would be in very, is very interesting to watch how it plays out is the, world, is the relationship of the online world and fashion. Because certainly it has the potential to drive fashions to move even faster, which is environmentally potentially quite disastrous. On the other hand, one question is, can we move some of this impetus to signal our status and affiliation through fat fashion into the online world? Things like Second Life and other kind of risky displays of fashion through our different types of online adoption where it is about pure information display. And when you may take the risk of making that, but when the item or the trend is discarded, it's the information disappears, but there's no physical object to be discarded with it. Um, so that's on, on fashion. I want to move um, a little bit to another domain for looking at signals, which is the role of understanding things such as faces through signaling. Um, in the world of um, anthropology and sociology and facial analysis, this is a very controversial question because a lot of what's interesting about faces is that we don't signal everything deliberately. A lot of what you sh show or reveal in your face might be an emotional response, it might be where your attention is you know, by where you're looking that may not be quite beneficial to you. So there's, a num there's still controversy that's very lively in the facial analysis psychology world about whether faces are primarily signals or unintended cues. Um, these are um, different uh, representations of the basic emotions and Ekman who did it's a sort of canonical image for a long time was very much on the side that these were not signals, that they, these just came out from, you know, they were expressions of our underlying feeling. And there's, you know, and I think he's ameliorated his approach to this over time with the arguments that people said that there really was no reason you would have something that would evolve so much to be at your own expense. Um, but the real question we want to look at here is how reliable are faces? This is a um, picture of Pinocchio, who's a somewhat mythical figure who every time he told a lie, his nose would grow longer. And so, uh, and so there, he's kind of a, a nice exemplar of what we really want to believe faces do. That you know, there's a great deal of belief that people's emotions and their ideas and what kind of character they have is revealed in their face. Now, a number of studies have shown that while people believe that they're very good at reading character and they're very good at reading emotion, in fact, we're not nearly as good as we, are, we think we are. So while we feel that we're very good at reading faces, we, we actually um, are, are, are much even better at being deceptive through our faces. Um, but so in the face-to-face in the -face world, there's a, a trade-off. We're very, very expressive. We use our face a lot to control how, what impression we make upon others. We tend to feel that without seeing another's face, we can't really understand what they're doing, but it's something where that the line between what is um, deceptive and what is read into things is quite balanced. Um, now this is a picture of faces in, again, if we go back to Second Life, and part of the appeal that people have in Second Life, and I think it's an important one to understand, is that people find it appealing because they say, well, I like to be able to see the other person. I like to be able to see their face. I'm more comfortable in an on, you know, when I'm just seeing text, I don't know who I'm dealing with. In Second Life, I like it, I'd like to see who that person is. But in fact, how reliable is that face? Now, this is um, an avatar that comes up pretty quickly when you make a new character there. And then this took about three minutes to turn this face into this face. Now, this is very nice and innocent. It's the kind of face where whatever this person says, you might say, wow, that's very trustworthy. I can believe it. This looks somewhat less trustworthy. They don't look really nice. They don't really look like someone you would necessarily believe. 
but all that's really been done to change the way we see this as a signal of character has been, I made the chin bigger, you just pull on, you have to just change the parameters. You make the chin a little bigger, the lips a little smaller, the nose a little bigger, and the forehead lower, and all of a sudden, you have a signal of sort of dishonesty and non-trustworthiness. Um, so where does this come from? One theory about this is that a lot of our way of, of reading the signal of the face comes from, and our mistakes that are made come from overgeneralization. So this is a face of a cartoon character. If you look at many cartoon characters, they have little tiny noses, they have very, very high foreheads and big eyes. Mickey Mouse looks like this, many little cartoon characters do. And if you look at those features, those are the features that are characteristic of babies. So this is called neoteny. It's faces that look a lot like babies and there's a, um, a number of psychologists, um, Vivian Salazar is one, who's looked a lot at what she calls an overgeneralization, which is we take something, so for instance, it is an evolved react response to a baby's face. Babies, you know, they cry, they're loud, they throw up on you. You know, in many objective senses, they're not very nice, but we look at them and we think, oh, I really want to take care of you, oh, you are so cute. There's a very, very deep and important for the survival of our species reaction to things that have high foreheads and other characteristic baby looks. But once you are no longer a baby, it turns out some faces have features that are more like those of a baby than another. They do not tell you anything in fact, about the underlying character or intellectual ability of the person who has them, but it turns out that we st still overgeneralize from our way, from our reaction to babies, in how we read these different faces. And so what happens when we start to bring things like faces into a interface, the different expressions, um, let me go back to this for a second, the way, the different ways that, um, we read the character can be these overgeneralizations. When you add to that the fact that faces online are something that is very, very easy to apply, I think what we see is that as a signal, what we've done is we've brought something that in the face-to-face -face world is a semi-reliable signal. There certainly are things about the expressions people make and how we read faces that do provide real information, though even in our face-to-face -face world it's highly problematic, both because of our ability to control it and be somewhat deliberately deceptive, and also because our ability to assess it is um, marginalized by our other regeneralizations and other ways that we mistake things. But in the online world, where the face itself is really a completely conventional signal, what we've done is brought something in that really shapes how we see something. If you look at these different expressions, this is done by Will Eisner, who's one of the early cartoonists, when he was trying to explain the power of graphic novels and cartooning. If you read any of these words going across, and look at how differently you hear in your mind the way they sound, based on the changing, just changing of a cartoon face, you see that it's a very, very powerful way of signaling something, but we have to remember that online it's as conventional as the words that we type. Um, these are some interesting studies also that have shown the power of faces because what's interesting here is that they're very, very powerful. This is um, some work by Jeremy Balenson at Stanford University. And what he did here is he took different um, faces of people running for office who people had very, very strong reactions to. But then he took the face of the candidate and combined it with the viewer's own face by about 40%. So when you looked at it, it still looked like the famous candidate, but it had been subtly mixed with your own face. And what he showed was people's approval and trust of a candidate, even if someone they did not trust already, went up very, very highly once it looked more like they looked. So you can see how it's an extraordinarily powerful symbol online However, it's really, really important to just keep in mind the ways that it can be easily manipulated. Um, and here again, this is, a, um, this is from Hanson Robotics. 
that there's a considerable amount of work that goes now into interfaces that are using faces. The reason I bring this up is that it's a constant trade-off in how we design different interactions because the face is such an appealing thing to add. Um, here is a robotic face, as Matt um, Hansen has been designing a number of these robots. These robots are not intelligent in any sense. They're actually relatively simple programs. These are not even as complicated or intelligent-like as an advanced artificial intelligence system. But when faced with them, it is very, very hard for people to believe that something with such a realistic face that's making realistic expressions at them is not really thinking. And so I think especially at, at, you know, for things like the design of learning systems, it's a very, very interesting trade-off to be making all the time is what is the role of the face online? Because it's extremely appealing, it gives us a whole other avenue of conveying all kinds of information, and yet it's something where it A, gives off all kinds of signals that we have to understand and be in control of what we're signaling with it. And at the same time, online, it has far less reliability than we're accustomed to in the real world and can be very, very easily used to lull people into a sense of trust, um, trust in something that is really no more trustworthy for having a face applied to it, no more intelligent that for having a face applied to it, but quickly can seem like it is simply because it has what is online, a conventional, the conventional signal of the face. Um, then the last part of what I want to talk about here as something that signaling theory can help us understand are social networking sites and looking at things such as privacy costs as some of the costs that perhaps are ensuring honesty in the online world. Um, the social networking sites are very, very interesting. There's a huge number of them. These are, you know, these range from, this is LinkedIn, which is very much, at least these are, I don't know how popular these particular ones are here. I don't, I know there are a number that are popular in Israel, though I'm less familiar with them. This is LinkedIn, which is very much of a, you know, very professional network. Down here is MySpace, which was always, which is very music related. Um, very youth oriented. There's even um, there's a social networking site for cats, <laughs> where people put their cats online. They connect through their animals. There's one called this Catster, and there's Dogster. It's probably Hamster and a number of others. So extremely popular. There's hundreds and hundreds of these sites. But and what's in, what's interesting here, I think the question is again. I mean, part of it is. To what extent are these a fashion and a fad? But also in terms of their structure, are they, do they start by their ways that they link people together? Are they starting to address some of the problems of identity in the online world? And in particular, you know, the basic structure of any of these sites, whether for people or for cats, is that you have a, a profile where you fill out something about yourself, what you like, depending on the site. It may change what types of things you talk about. Um, and then link to other people elsewhere on the site. And that's, that is really the basic structure. And then through these links, you can follow these other friends and, and acquaintances. So the first question is, how reliable are those links as some kind of meaning? This is an ad. MySpace, um, until recently, was the most popular site worldwide. It's now been succeeded by um, Facebook. But one of the issues with um, MySpace was the sense that do these links have any meaning? You look at someone's site, they have thousands of friends. Are they really that popular? Is there anything about those connections that tells us something? This is an ad that says hundreds of MySpace ads. It's a program that you could get into and it would guarantee you hundreds of friend, new friends a day. Clearly, this is not friend as we usually think of the term. And it's very important because the, a lot of the idea behind the site is that by putting yourself in the context of people who really know you, you supposedly are gaining some additional level of reliability. But if this network of friends that you have is made out of thousands of people that you just got connected to through some algorithm, clearly it's, it's completely meaningless. There's no cost to those signals. And so effectively, one way of um, analyzing and also designing the future of these sites is to really look at what are the costs 
that make those links a reliable type of connection. Because what we really want to have here is something that says, because I've put myself in this context of being linked to all these other people, those links really ensure that when you look at me and through this connection, it means that the things I will say about myself will be more reliable, the claims that I can make, or how I might function in some kind of group. These are big public sites, but increasingly um, different companies are using these internally to um, help people in the company meet or exchange information. So a lot of the basic social questions of, you know, is this person cooperative? Are they going to free ride on everyone else's efforts, etc., are the sort of subtle things that people want to know about each other, and can these sites help us? Um, this is an example of um, one of the projects that one of my students did that tried to start addressing this question because this is looking at communication patterns in MySpace. And in MySpace, um, in particular, being wrong about your assessment about whether someone was a good person to add to your group, while people were adding thousands at a time, or they'd be getting thousands of these friend requests, making a mistake and adding the wrong person could be very costly because there were a lot of viruses on the site that would pass through bad connections. And so once you accepted someone who you probably shouldn't have, all of a sudden you'd find your own page being full of spam, etc. Um, and so being able to quickly assess of these many people who was reliable and who wasn't was important. So what this did here was, it, again I know it's hard to see, was it took the typical network diagram and it also showed the paths of actual communication between people. So you could see like, are the, which ones of these connections are really talking to each other and sending messages back and forth versus other weaker ones that would, are much more likely to be meaningless. One way of looking at this in terms of signaling is the, goal, the design goal here. Um, one of the pieces in the economics of signaling that we look at is, you know, we've talked a lot about the cost of making a signal. So you say you want to keep the, the cost reliable, um, high of making it deceptively. But especially when we're looking at things like social sanctions, an important thing to keep in mind is receiver costs. Going back for a minute to the world of biology, there was a, a paper by um, Guilford and Dawkins that talked about receiver costs, and their example of what was with bullfrogs is that all of the male bullfrogs will go into what's called a lack, and they'll, they'll sing their bullfrog songs, and the females would listen to them, and based on these songs, they would find you know, the most attractive males. But the problem with something like that is there's a huge receiver cost to this, because the longer you sit around listening to the males calling, the more likely you are to be eaten by a predator who has also come here. So the, there's a real cost in spending too much time assessing this behavior. Now in MySpace you're not necessarily going to be eaten by a predator, but if it's going to take you 15 minutes to assess, every, if to follow all these different links, etc., people are not going to do this. So a lot of the goal in design here is to make things where it's not only, it's, we look not only at the cost of making a deceptive signal, but also at making the cost of assessing a signal be very, very low. So here, the idea of doing visualizations, for instance, that will give you a quick understanding of somebody's network in this, what we call this public displays of connection, are, um, is as important as making it, or it may be the easier way than trying to add the cost to making the signal. Another piece of what people pay for in these sites are our privacy costs. This is another network diagram showing, just, this is actually from my network on Facebook, and the idea here, here is you can just see, there's a number, like here you can see two very big distinct groups. If you think about your own life and how, um, and how you, what are the things you tell different people in your life, you'll realize that it's probably divided into diff different segments. You have things you tell pe your family, there's these things about yourself that you'll share with friends, there are the things that you share with your colleagues, and it's not the same things. As these sites are currently designed today, what's both interesting and disturbing about them is they collapse these different groups. So when people sign up for a site, they start to connect to people in all different contexts, 
And what you get is this collapse of privacy. What you might say to your family is shown to your work colleagues. So one piece is, for many people, they simply say this will greatly limit what I say. So that's one set of privacy costs. Or it will change the opinion people have by revealing more about myself than I wanted to say. So when we look again at trying to analyze what type of um, society is being created as we have these increasingly complex set of links that are played out as part of our public representation of ourselves, a lot of the costs we need to assess are not in terms of money or in time, but in terms of how much privacy we are willing to give up or what are we willing to give up in terms of um, maintaining our privacy. And then finally, what I wanted to um, look at here is also from this notion of things like Facebook, etc., is that we're living increasingly in a world of ceaseless information. And I think this is one of the themes that ties a lot of this together. And as I started the talk out, I said that you know, signaling is really about understanding our world, ourselves in a world that's more and more about living in a world of information. We live today in a world in which there is a constant set of streams of information. You can get news from around the world updated by the second. You can get global news that way. You can get local news from any city, town, almost any village that you want. There is an increasing number of technologies that are out there to provide people with an ongoing stream of status updates of other people's random musings at any moment. You know, some of these. In the background, I have um, news sites in the foreground are from three um, status sites such as Twitter um, and SQL and a couple of others where people will sit and write, I'm at the airport, I'm waiting for the train, I just had my coffee. Some of it is posting of interesting news, some is very mundane. Some of this can be really useful. It's part of how we function as a society. It's not just getting really important information from others, but a lot of it is just being able to see what are the trends, what are the ways people are thinking, how are people doing, how are they responding to each other, how do we, understand, how do we observe how other people behave so that we know how to behave ourselves. But you know, we're reaching a point where it's, vast, it's a vast oversaturation of this type of information. And so a lot of what you know, we're seeing here is the importance of things such as fashion writ large. How do we know which of these things to follow? Where, where do we understand what are the things we can safely ignore? How do we understand what things like this may be doing to something such as fashion and are, what may be new emerging ways that society is structured? Um, and so I think what I'm hoping what I've gotten across here today is some notion of, of signaling theory as a way of understanding the economics of how we communicate in a world that's increasingly not about observing things directly, but in needing to constantly assess information and signals about those characteristics.